Or if we go outdoors, you'll see the building. So have you, have you ever been to King's Cross in London? Oh, yeah, I have actually, loads of times. So we're just opposite the biggest art school in Europe here. That's the Guardian building, so that's the liberal newspaper. And this is the new Google office, which is going up of Bjark Engels, biggest uh, kind of office in London at the moment going up. And then our, our building is this. So that's the offices that we were just in. That's the restaurant and then the... St an Austrian track lighting company. So you see these lamps and these lamps which are all part of a kind of Meccano system for building. So it's just a track lighting system like this um, with one component, which is just a circuit board. Oh, and then that forms, just those two elements form the departure point for anything that you choose to make. So there's massive columns, huge wall installations, Kind of screens of light um, and that's it two components making a whole new language go into this room which is a sort of cocktail bar and then we'll see um, a new glassware collection which is really based on the simplest shapes of glassware Champagne, um, martini, um, drinking water glass, a pepper grinder. So quite architectural as a kind of table landscape, which we've tried to put together here. So that's that room. In in the in the first room that you saw, we've also got the extensions of the the fat furniture, which is um, called fat for obvious reasons. There's some new pieces. This lounge, which is kind of slightly modular and um, sofa. So this one is a Chesnel. Yeah. Um, and you know, you, you can put these chairs together like a love seat. And, um, and these come also as bar stools and restaurant chairs. So they, they originated in our restaurant. Um, and the restaurant is a really good place to kind of um, test out things. Is it even the door handle? Yeah, so this is another collaboration with D-Line, a Danish um, architectural line among group. But you can see the same kind of fat profile on the chairs and the door handles. Here we've got the cork collection, which is in the discotheque. Um, and there's a weird thing going on, which is that I'm on a yeah, I'm, I'm on the computer talking and in I'm real life talking. I'm going to present you Octagon, which is our information. Um, so we're going to go down into the depths of the building here. It's an 1850s building, which um, is part of the Victorian infrastructure of, of London. And it takes us the back route to the shop rather the store, as you call it, in America. Canteen. This is the stock room. And here is the prep kitchen with the chefs. Making cake. There's my motorcycle. Oh, you froze. I can't see the motorcycle. You can't, not enough light. I think it froze. There we go. There it is. And then there's the delicatessen, which we opened during COVID. 
um, when the restaurant had to close, we, we, we opened this green grocer, um, which is um, we're going to keep permanently now because it's working really well. Apples. Um, and then the, the store with the new objects, which are the swirl objects. So these are actually candles. Then some furniture, which is very Memphis inspired. Furniture made out of solid brass extrusions, very shiny. I mean, it's so shiny, actually, it's blinding me. <laughs> and this is another kind of kit of parts that is destined to um, be adaptable by architects and specifiers. Here's a kind of storage shelf. And here's the, the mass table, which is, again, very long. It actually looks better underneath. As you can see underneath the legs yeah so they, they're all built up just these pieces of brass here we go ouch oh you're right yeah i'm gonna live s chair museum so lots of versions of the s chair um this is the, the one of the very early versions made out of recycled in a in a tube so it's really deteriorated the latex um this is the original Bull Rush version. And a um, collection of glass called Press. Um, lighting section. These are uh, uh, lamps called Spring. Hello. Which are uh, inspired by Slinky Toys. This is an electric motorcycle, not of my design. But this is the future of transportation right here. And um, then the perfumery, which is um, where we make smells. Now, how did you come up with this concept for uh, the octagon? Which concept, sorry? The octagon concept? Well, the octagon is, is, is kind of, this is more the inflated version. I mean, the origins of it is, is really that we have so many, you can see we've got so many stories to tell. We've got a lot of pent up um, new launches and, and uh, a lot of ideas which should have been launched in Frankfurt or in Milan or even in New York or Shanghai. And um, we've missed all of the fairs. So we wanted to take a show on the road which showed all of these different ideas and also gave a bit of the history of, of what we do and some of the best sellers and blah, blah, blah. So that, that made eight ideas. And, and so we built a structure which is really based on, um, um, on, on being able to put that structure in the back of a, of a truck um, and just take the show on the road. Because I think with the absence of trade fairs, we have to be more flexible, we have to be more mobile. We've got to go out to the customer. I mean, obviously our ambitions to do that in America have been destroyed by the, by the uh, lockdown. Um, we started it off in, in Shanghai, so that, that's, that's traveling a bit in China right now. And then here, what we've done is just expand those eight windows and, and put them into our store because we can. But as soon as um, the restrictions end in, in Europe, we'll, we'll take this show um, on the road as the original idea, which is the octagon, which is a eight-sided structure. And where will you be going next? The first stop when you can travel again, or when it can. Well, travel. that really, you know, that's that's out of our control. Which is sort of the idea is that you just have something which is flexible, easy to move, easy to set up. And as soon as um, a lockdown finishes in in one country, you just get on the road and and you, and you travel it, right? So it's a response to 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 the unknown in a way. So was this born out of necessity, or was this always the plan to take the show on the road? No, we've done we've done a, a series of, of tours, and I, you know, for me, having come out of um, the music business a bit, 
um, you know, the, the, the way that you, you know, particularly in America, it's a classic way of doing it. You go to see all the small radio stations with your new album and you work, you work it, right? You know, the, although, although, you know, this week in London last year, we got 35,000 people through the door this time or, or in Milan Furniture Fair, maybe 40,000. You know, we're just not going to see those kind of numbers. But, you know, the quantity of people isn't always that important. You know, the, the smaller, more personal events often yield more, um, more results in, in terms of being able to actually concentrate your efforts on, on people that are really interested. And in, in so, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm not despairing. I just think you've got to be more, you know, you've got to be more entrepreneurial. Besides the obvious, how uh, for you has London Design Week changed? Oh my God. I mean, you know, we had this kind of really amusing Zoom uh, medal ceremony. It normally, it would be a huge banquet with 200 people, but everybody got delivered a hamper and you had to once again get on your laptop. And um, although, you know, it was amusing and interesting, the reality is that there's a limit right there's a limit to how many zoom calls you can you can do there's a limit to um to, to really particularly in our trade which is really about physical spaces and physical objects to, to how much you know how much point there is in doing this so that's why i'm, I'm kind of yearning to get back out again i mean i spent my lockdown in a in a greenhouse making things so it was quite liberating but i think you know right now we've got to to really um be super entrepreneurial and super flexible just to survive i mean all of us because it's going to be tough in the next couple of months right a hundred percent do you have a you know speaking of being entrepreneurial what kind of ideas have been born during this time for you personally well i've been thinking a lot about um about the nature of, of space you know that this idea that you have to keep your distance from people could be seen as a really big nightmare but you can remember maybe even you know, eight months ago, people complaining that there wasn't enough space. So, you know, there, there's something quite interesting about the VIP nature of of, um, of, of, of being a bit more alone or, or having a couple of meters between you and the next person. You remember when you've been in a club and all you wanted to do was get in the VIP lounge, right? Because there was more space and, and, and better people. And I think I'm trying to think of, of how that, I mean, that's worked a lot on public transportation, you know, over the last few months. My God, you know, it's a super luxury traveling by train at the moment because they're so clean because they've been like sanitized by crews and because there's nobody on them. So you get the whole carriage to yourself, not just just one seat. So we're, 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 we're seeing a kind of a complete um, change in, in how people behave. And that's always interesting from a, a kind of design perspective. And, and, you know, I see a lot of cracks appearing, but in those cracks, you can kind of grow weeds, you know, the, the, there's lots of, of small bits of entrepreneurship. And I think, you know, the, 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 the key thing is that cooperation is going to become much more important between brands, between different disciplines, and also small is going to become more beautiful, you know, in, in, in a way. Is that how you felt initially anyway, or have you kind of pivoted in your thinking too? Uh, I mean, some of the things that I've been wanting to do here, which was, you know, more flexible working um, space, more flexible working hours, more more um, over, overlap between the restaurant, the store and, and, and the office is, has been forced upon us. So, I'm, you know, I'm not saying I'm happy about it. We've had to let some people go. Um, we've, we've had to, you know, everybody's in a state of, of, of panic still or crisis management. But it does open up kind of opportunities to... Um, to have a new conversation, you know. Are you developing new legs to the business in any way? New, new what? Uh, new arms or new legs to the business? New, new arms and legs. Yeah, but they're top secret. <laughs> well, that's not fair. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, when, when, when they're, you know, I, I did some stuff too early and got into trouble. You know, I broke the rules and, and um, so I have to be very careful about about some of the ideas I've had. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess how have how has your life changed in this time period and beyond your work, which sounds like um, you still get to be creative and have all these amazing ideas, which is wonderful. Well, you know, I mean, it's it's a, a cliche, isn't it? But I mean, the the, the reality is that the when things change, you know, n number one, this business was born maybe 
you know, I can remember that the first conversation I had about this business was when I was watching the, the planes crashing into the, the world, you know, 18 years ago or 19 years ago. And so the first conversation was on 9-11. So then followed the really big recession. And so this business was born in, in, in a kind of financial crisis of some sort. And, um, you know, so I've lived through several of them even before that. And, and um, it, it, it does force you to be, you know, to be more flexible and more creative. And, and also there's some things that, that come as a byproduct of, of it, which is space becomes cheaper, for instance. You know, London had become, you know, just like New York, kind of overwhelmingly expensive for creative people. And, and you know, I see a, a slight reversal of that already. The spaces that are empty that become available to people. And it's going to be tough, right? There's no denying. But, you know, in the end, um, you know, humans are very, very good at adapting. And, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, pain on the way. But ultimately, the, the, there's definitely new ways of looking at things being forced upon us. I don't think any of them are particularly um, any more radical than what people were talking about. But now people are forced, forced to work from home. People are, you know, um, forced to, um, to, to, to be completely electronic. And, and it's, it was happening anyway. It just wasn't happening this fast. Mm. <clears throat> and where does your inspiration come from? You mentioned that you've got pieces called Memphis. So um, did, did you actually, did the inspiration come from Memphis for those? Well, you know, I think the colours lent themselves immediately to those kind of quite blocky forms, you know. And I mean, I, I, I think that, um, you know, I had the, 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 the great pleasure and, and luxury of, of meeting, you know, and actually working with Sotsas and, and a few of those people. I hated the stuff at the time, you know, when, when, it, when it first came out, it was, you know, my work was very much a reaction to Memphis. I thought it was too plasticky, too colourful, too blocky. And, and there I am mimicking it you know many many years later so i've grown you know i've grown to love it um because i, I i've uh, uh you know I've, I've i've become more inclusive in my thinking if you like and um and it's, it's definitely a, a a direct homage to, to that um, but it was really about finding the correct surfaces to display those really quite um ridiculous um colors and patterns and and the the kind of Memphis block aesthetic was particularly uh, was particularly useful for that, um, and that joy of, of of artificial pattern really is something that I think was taught to us by by that gang. And where else do you get your inspiration from? Typically, does it just come from whatever you see, or? Well, I mean, it's it's quite rare for for my inspiration to come from design movements. I mean, I'm much much more interested in in. Um, almost every discipline apart from my own you know the the, the reality of, of, um, uh, of where i get my inspiration from is it really hasn't changed a great deal my inspiration is really how you make things so i love the techniques whether they're in industrial or or whether those are off techniques i love playing with i think you know as i kind of um uh, post rational I was, well, it was really in this class at school, the kind of really quite ugly and greasy material clay into something desirable. It was, You're cutting out a bit. Um, yeah, well, out of, out of any material, really. And then, you know, when I discovered steel, it was really, it was much more about um, how quickly you could build stuff out of steel and how malleable it was. So I still have a fascination for that. And, and then as I've learned how to um, work different materials, I've got more interested in the machinery and the techniques that, that underpin it. And that joy is still there, really. But then the inspiration sometimes comes here from, you know, a direct um, uh, um, conclusion from something that doesn't work at the restaurant so I want, I want to find you know the bar stores from the fat collection came from there because we were um we couldn't find something on the market which did that job you know so we had to create it ourselves so you know this becomes this whole kind of shop and restaurant becomes a kind of um test bed for um ideas and and you know by doing things like making a temporary disco here um, I start working on things like acoustics, which is something which interests me a lot at the moment in terms of interior design. So, you know, the cork table I was showing you is interesting 
mainly because it absorbs sound, you know, um, not just because it's a, a really beautiful material. So th this, these tables here, which um, are made out of monumental bits of cork, uh, actually acoustically efficient. So here I'm emitting sound from this big sound system. I'm illuminating it with this very disco chandelier, which would have looked quite good at Studio 54. Um, and then I'm absorbing the sound down here with the cork, and I've covered every single surface also with cork to see what happens and then whether we can get an optimum um, space for, for listening to music, but also being able to hear what your guest is saying at dinner kind of thing. So this becomes a kind of experimental sound room, actually. So Where I can also that, practice my bass guitar here. Oh, very cool. <laughs> So were the perfumery lab and the lounge and bar, were those always in existence or are they simply there for Octagon? No, I mean, we, we, we set up the shop with kind of um, six or seven different, um, uh, six or seven different um, sections, a bit like a mini department store. You know, one or two of them evolve every, every six months, you know. The, the delicatessen was something we called the factory before, which was producing um, ceramics. Um, the perfumery was uh, a collaboration with Teenage Engineering, which is uh, our, our uh, music partners. And so, you know, we, 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 we like to change things up from time to time, but the um, basic idea of having um, six or seven, and this time eight, as in Octagon, different sections talking about different subjects is still there. Very, very cool. Um, and I guess, oh, there we go. Your uh, screen keeps on cutting out a little bit. Um, I've got one last question for you, and then I want to ask if you want to share anything. But my last question is, uh, what to you is the greatest luxury in life and why? Well, I think, you know, I kind of answered that um, before, which is in this space. I think, you know, the, the, the modern human craves um, space, whether that's space to think, um, space to live, um, you know, just just space to be. And, and um, that for me is kind of the biggest luxury. And, and again, as I was explaining earlier, something which I've been very fortunate over pandemic to find more space, you know, my greenhouse is, you know, three acres of, you know, completely clear luminous space. And that's been very luxurious. Um, the, the space I got on the train, uh, commuting up from Brighton is very, you know, very transformational. So that's my big, uh, you know, my, my big luxury right now. Brilliant. And is there anything else you want to share about um, Octagon or your offices or um, anything really? Well, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's a, a bit sad that we missed New York and the uh, and the um, opportunity to show some of these ideas in, in, in the States. Um, we had a lot of things planned, um, but I guess um, we're looking now at January to try and probably get the show on the road again. So I'm looking forward to making it back to the US of A um, and seeing what's going on there. I mean, I, I, you know, fr from over here, from on this side of the water, there, we've got a lot of problems. It looks like you've got, you know, even bigger ones right now. So it's kind of sad to see the West Coast burning like it is. And then my sympathy goes out for everybody there. Um, but from a, a product perspective, it's just, you know, keep on looking, keep on tuning in um, and keep on staying in touch. I think the, this idea that, you know, we have more personal conversation with our customers and, and we have more cooperation and connection is actually the only good thing that can come out of, of, of this whole mess really.